Hello, I'm Brian Farrell, and welcome to Pace IT's session on WAN Technologies Part 3. Today I'm going to briefly discuss Metro Ethernet WAN connections, then I'm going to move on to Least Line WAN connections, and we're going to conclude with some common standards. And with that, let's go ahead and begin this session. Of course, I'm going to begin by discussing Metro Ethernet WAN connections. A Metro Ethernet connection is when the service provider connects to the customer's site through an RJ45 connector. The customer will view that WAN connection as an Ethernet connection, while in reality, the type of connection will be dependent upon the level of service that has been purchased. The service provider may also use a variety of different wide area network technologies behind the scenes, but the customer will always view it as being an Ethernet connection. Metro Ethernet is commonly deployed as a wide area network technology by municipalities at the Metropolitan Area Network or MAN level, as in at the municipal level. It's time for us to discuss Least Line WAN connections. A Least Line is a dedicated circuit or connection between two endpoints used for communication. When we're talking about IT, a Least Line is usually a digital point-to-point -point connection. A Least Line can utilize either a plain old telephone service line, a POTS line, on the public switched telephone network, or it can be a fiber optic circuit provided by a telecommunications company. Leased lines tend to be more expensive for the customer as the circuit can't be utilized by any other entity. So the whole cost is borne by the customer because they're the only ones who get to use it. Most often the speed of a leased line is limited by what the customer is willing to pay. There are some multiplexing technologies out there that can be used to increase the amount of channels that are provided on the connection. One of the least line technologies that you need to know about is point-to-point -point protocol, PPP. It is a common data link layer or layer 2 protocol that's used with least line networks. PPP can simultaneously transmit multiple Layer 3 protocols. It can transmit IP and IPX and AppleTalk all at the same time through the use of control protocols, which are actually specific to the Layer 3 protocol that's being transmitted. PPP can include a feature called Multilink PPP, which allows for multiple physical interfaces to be bonded together and act as a single logical interface. This effectively increases the available bandwidth to that system. There are different types of leased line connections. In the United States, Japan, and South Korea, there are T carrier lines. Each T line is composed of 24 digital signal channels. These are often called Digital Signal Zero channels, or DSO channels. Each channel is capable of carrying 64 kilobits per second. The 24 DSOs make up what is called a DS1 channel. In Europe, we have E-carrier lines. Each E-line is composed of 30 digital signal channels. These are also called DSO channels. The 30 DSO channels also make up what is called a DS1 channel. When we're talking about fiber optic speeds, we often talk about optical carrier lines, or OC lines. The OC data rates per channel are established by both the SONNET and SDH networking standards. SONNET is the United States standard, and SDH is the international standards. Interestingly enough, the OC rates are the same across the two standards. It's possible to multiplex multiple channels into the same fiber using different methods. 
And the first method is dense wavelength division multiplexing, DWDM. It allows for up to 32 separate channels on a single fiber cable. Or you could use coarse wavelength division multiplexing, which allows for up to eight separate channels on a single fiber optic cable. Let's conclude with common standards. The standards I'm going to be talking about are the speeds. And we begin with T lines. A T1 is composed of 24 DSO channels, which are also known as a DS1. And it's capable of achieving speeds of up to 1.544 megabits per second. If that's not fast enough for you, you can lease a T3 line. It's composed of 28 T1 lines. Now a T3 line is also known as a DS3 and it can achieve speeds of up to 44.736 megabits per second. If you're in Europe, you might lease an E1 line. An E1 line, which is composed of 30 DSO channels, can achieve speeds of up to 2.048 megabits per second. Just as with the United States, if that's not fast enough for you, you can lease an E3 line, which is composed of 16 E1 lines which gives you up to 34.368 megabits per second speed. While a T1 is slower than an E1, a T3 is faster than an E3. For OC lines, we have the OC1. It's capable of 51.84 megabits per second in speed. Then there is the OC3, which gives you up to 155.52 megabits per second speed. It's becoming more common now to see OC12s. With those, you get up to 622.08 megabits per second. If you want gigabit type speed, you might consider leasing an OC48. That gives you up to 2.488 gigabits per second in bandwidth. Currently at the top of the line is the OC192. That gives you up to 9953 gigabits per second speed. So essentially 10 gigabits per second worth of bandwidth. Now that concludes this session on WAN Technologies Part 3. I briefly discussed Metro Ethernet WAN connections and then I went on to a discussion about leased line WAN connections and then I briefly mentioned some common standards. On behalf of Pace IT, thank you for watching this session and I hope to do another one soon.